Welcome to Wednesday in Westeros. I'm Taylor Trask. And I'm Todd A. And it is yet another week. Episode four has just finished. We're recording this on a Tuesday, so it's been a few days. Um, but yeah, We got bumped, but to make up for it, I watched the episode three times. Three times? Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm still I'm still looking at it pure. I'm still I'm still my my one time. And I, I say that because it was a yet again so jam packed with stuff and story. And it's like I dare say season six is quickly becoming my favorite season if if they keep this up. Well, I mean, probably because of uh some slow seasons before that. So um I that'll be a good thing to keep in mind as this progresses. Like where are they I don't know. That's what we're doing every week. What are, where are they delivering where they didn't deliver last year? I mean, we beat it to death a little bit, but do you think do you think this is the result of not having to be tied to the books so specifically? I, I really wonder. Um, I, you know, there's there's a great theory uh, that someone I assume on the Storm of Spoilers podcast brought up uh, because they literally talk about everything. So that's where I just nick all my great ideas. Um, and I, I think it was there that they put forth the theory that the show and George Martin had an agreement, mm-hmm. which was basically like, we're going to kill Jon Snow and tell everyone he's dead. And then, George, you get to decide how to bring him back. Because when they were probably producing that that uh, season, you know, supposedly Martin was completing that book, mm-hmm. which then we only found out after the season was over that not only had he not completed it, then he missed his deadline for getting it out before the next season. And then he's missed all deadlines for this year. So I really like that idea that like they, maybe they, maybe that was sort of their intention was like, we're going to catch up to you and we're going to put it, the ball in your court. And then he just dropped it. Well, you could also make the argument. I mean, I agree with all that too, but you could also make the argument. We're just in the natural story arc itself. We are, we have to ramp up to get to the end. And this is the part of that ramp up, you know? Yeah. You could argue. And I've seen people say, yeah, season five was kind of a letdown, but in the grand scheme of things, it was that pause before it really heats up. For, you know, if you look at any movie or any, you know, before you get to the third act, there's always that sort of boring, meddling sort of part in the second act that sort of pulls you down a little bit or just gets gets a little bit slow for whatever reason. And then maybe that's what season five is. Maybe it'll just be this from here on out from a story standpoint. Well, and then on the other hand, I don't, you know, I, it's hard for me having read the books to complain because if season five was truly book four and five compressed, mm-hmm. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like get it over with because um, those books were just tortuous. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I'm happy with the, the way things are. Um, it's funny because I wonder if I, I'm just throwing that out because I wonder as the season progresses and as we get into next year, if we're going to think, gosh, the things that we loved about it in the first three seasons aren't in it anymore. <laughs> I think, I, but I don't, I disagree. I think in Latin, this, this episode four was a great example. There were so many shout outs and little visual cues and even character moments from seasons one through three that, that were just packed throughout. I mean, and right off the bat, the biggest scene, all the feels, all the feels, Todd, Sansa, <laughs> Sansa and John finally reunite. And you know, we knew it was coming. I honestly was a little surprised. They showed, they, they made it to the wall that fast. Um, yet again, it's here's how little I trust the show is that I didn't know it was coming. Wow. I just didn't, I just didn't even trust it. I, when they, when we saw that preview of the, the gates opening, uh, last week and, mm. uh, Sansa and Brienne and Podrick were on their horses there. I thought, ah, oh, shit, they're going to be like the Umbers castle or something. <laughs> and the Umbers are going to take them prisoner. And then for the yeah. rest of this season, they're going to be with them. I just did not trust them to to put them together, and certainly not so fast. So that was that would have been season five Game of Thrones, but this is the all new, all improved Game of Thrones, where things happen <laughs> right. quickly and with effort, and and with because it's just yeah. It, if this was last season, it's one more thing that would have been drugged out, drug out for five episodes. Oh, they're headed to the wall. They get stuck. They get stopped by this random you know roving gang of thieves that we, has no barrier like. But no, there's like they're there here because we don't we don't need like we need story to happen again. My chief right. complaint in our sort of preview of season six was stuff needs to happen. Stuff needs to we need to move people to where they need to be quickly. Yeah. And that seems to be where their where their heads are at. So I'm so grateful for it. And I this, the way they, that scene was played out, where you know it opens on Ed and John talking mm-hmm. about John leaving, and then 
it's like just as you're thinking like, oh, man, we got like five minutes of conversation about being part of the Night's Watch. There's the horn and it <laughs> smash cut, gates opening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was amazing. Like that was just such a cool – And they um, played it so well. I mean Sansa and John, the, actor, yeah. the actors who play those characters, you could tell. Like the, it almost is like they were – they were the physical representations of our our desires as viewers. Like we wanted to see these Starks back together in some configuration, and it was almost like, oh man, they're carrying the weight of that so well. So I I got from that from that point on, I was just like, I'm in, I'm sold. Whatever you, whatever else you have to sell me, I've I've already purchased it. So well, what did you think about their conversation? Like when they 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 cut to them eating yeah. soup and mm-hmm. and having sort of a friendly moment. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's I think it was kind of cool that you know John John for for a moment John. John had to like kind of feel like he had to validate the night's watch existence. He's like, you know, it's all we have. And she's like, it's fine. You know, it's like, it's almost like, Oh wow. I like, like civilization has finally touched him again, you know? So, and think about that. That's the first time he has seen anybody that wasn't right. a wildling white Walker or night's watchman since he got there. Um, <laughs> Not counting Tyrion, which was more of a random. I mean, he that was kind of right early on. So John's been at the wall for what four or five years in Showtime, yeah. um, or story of the Showtime, and has not seen civilization. So all of a sudden, here here's somebody who's his sister, so he wants to show hospitality to, but just somebody who is not of this miserable world, you know. Yeah. Who's, who's, I, I, you, oh, I take it back, Stannis. But Stannis is almost, you know, he represented battle and you know dreary right, sort right. Of stuff too so, so there, there was just that connection to his past and his family and yeah the way things used to be i mean they're talking about old nan and stuff like that yeah I, yeah i guess i in that moment i it was one of those moments that you get a lot in in tv or, or movies where i'm going <laughs> oh my god you have so much to tell each other like yes. why are you just staring into the fire like yeah why are you just start talking you know she knows that brienne has seen aria mm. um I, I just, you know, I, I don't remember. I just felt like there's, you got news, like think catch of, up. Yeah, but think about it though. Put yourself in that situation. I've been in that situation where there is so <laughs> much to say. Where do you start? Yeah. Like you just kind of have to sort of recalibrate a little bit. Like, oh God, why? Well, I, I hear this person I haven't seen and I've, I've been wanting to see it for so long and I just have so much to say. And I, hey, how are you? <laughs> it's more like, right. you know, they, I, I thought they played it beautifully. I did love no, it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I agree. I got. I mean, I'm I'm agreeing. I did that thought occurred to me, but I did I did appreciate the way they played it. Um, I love exactly the right. fact that it's almost kind. Of, we for so many seasons now, we've seen Jon Snow, man in charge, man who knows what to do, man with a mission. And in that scene, it was almost the reverse, where Sansa was like the one in charge, and Jon was just kind of like, okay, I guess. Yeah. Like it seems like Jon's rebirth has been a almost I dare I say like a a clean slate wipe of his character. Like it's like he he's come back and he's almost reset to where he was in season 1 where he just isn't sure about what to do or who he is or what's going on and so it was kind of cool to see Sansa be like, "All right, here's the deal, here's what we're going to do and uh you know, if you don't want to do this, then I'm going to do it anyway." So uh, you know, this is Yeah, this- she's mentioning taking back Winterfell when it's just the two of them. And so yeah. then they have that dinner later and you know she brings it up again and i mean she's obviously the take taking like that role is sort of moving from from his hands to hers so it was the first time i'd ever in this entire show where i've ever seen sansa be truly be her father's daughter you know truly be right. her mother's daughter like she embodied both ned yeah. and catelyn so well right then and there and she was i mean she was talking to one of her her family but just it it was the first time and maybe you know, we've talked about this before too. Maybe all the bull crap she's had to go through to get here was worth it to have these satisfying moments where she has truly grown as a character. Um, you could argue maybe not. Maybe she could have done it without all the, you know, the craziness. But you know, at the same time, it feels like at least at least they're paying that off a little bit now, and hopefully moving forward. Yeah, they, they've they've got a lot to pay back. So yeah, <laughs> hopefully they're going to do it. I mean, I you know when, when I originally made these notes, uh, I think during my second viewing. Um, I, I made a note, like, did you catch that meaningful look from Brienne to Tormund right as she, they wrote in? And then, of course, I've seen Twitter light up with that. So yeah, I, so I did <laughs> not notice. I, I noticed the Tormund to Brienne look. Uh, well, that's what I meant. Yeah, because oh, okay, I mean, her, she just kind of looked like she's like, oh, God, like, <laughs> like, I don't. Where am I? I don't want any part of this. I do think those two characters, it's fun that those two characters would be put in a position where they have to at least befriend each other, you know, um, I mean, 
the big giant babies they could make. Oh God! But it's and, and maybe you know it, it. It would be kind of fun. I, I hope they don't waste a lot of time on like uh, you know, on Brian <laughs> Brian Truman shipping. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, too, like. I, I feel like, you know, maybe Tormund's the first man who would respect her as a warrior woman, you know? Uh, no, I think you're exactly right. I think that's totally what it was, with, like, just this awe that she walks in on. And then, even though Tormund doesn't witness it, that that look of, of respect and fear that she gets from Davos and Melisandre when she yeah. walks over – I mean, they're they're having a private conversation where, <laughs> she rolls we, up. <laughs> where, we, where we realize, you know, what I thought was so – Great, because I just kind of forgotten about it. Was Davos doesn't know what happened to Shireen? Yeah. Oh, that's right. And that's the first time that he's confronted Melisandre and said, yeah. "And what about Shireen?" And then to have Brienne immediately say, "I saw what happened. I was there." And it's like I just I felt like for Melisandre, you know, her like Melisandre's going, "Oh shit, I'm caught." Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I'm not going to have any friends up here. Yeah. If Davos finds out that I. Uh, you know, supervised the burning of Stannis' yeah, daughter. Yeah. One, so that just, that scene. Well, I like that scene for a couple of reasons. Yeah. One, um, Davos. You, you know, there's a lot of consternation out there from fans saying everything Davos is doing this season is out of character. I still defend and stand by the fact that everything he's doing is very much in character. As I've said before, he is a hopeless romantic from season two when he was introduced. This has been the case. You know, everything he does is out of loyalty and hope for you know somebody good to do something you know and 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 go that way so the fact yeah. that he's aligning with Melisandre and and I think people are maybe making more out of it than they can here are two people who have been in each other's orbit they have not gotten along but they're literally the last I mean they're that they're all that remains of Stannis Baratheon's army kingdom whatever like they're it I don't yeah. think there's any other Stannis soldiers roaming around um Castle Black right now I think it's just these two and so, like, they only have each other. I think Davos, you know, is kind of just willing to go, oh, all right, you know, this is, this is the only connection I have left to anything anymore. I'm like, my son's dead. Yeah, and granted, like, she, he could blame her for his son's death, you know, because his son was kind of a Lord of Light disciple um, early on, too. And you could say oh, he yeah. may, may have died. Because, so he has a lot to blame her for, but I think he's such, an, he's such a hopeless, in a hopeless state um, that he's willing to at least kind of, you know, take her on as, you know, in some way, shape, or form and kind of trust in her to, you know, it's like just us two. But... I think it's still fragile enough where all he needs to hear is that, yeah, she supervised Marine, you know, Shireen's death and he'd run her through, you know? Yeah. Um, it's also interesting to see it, that dynamic when, when Bran comes rolling up on him, like, hey, guess what? I killed your king and uh, I know you're the one that did. You know, she basically calls out oh, yeah. Melisandre going, I know you're the one that killed that basically some of the thing that killed Renly, who I loved. You know, remember that, everybody? And then looked at Davos going, yeah, and I killed your king. And I just, it just seemed like there was some tension in Davos. Like, oh, shoot, should I, should I be avenging him now? Like, it, it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Like, you know, Brienne killed Stannis because Stannis basically killed, you know, it, it indirectly killed Renly. So, you know, she had to avenge her king. Now Davos basically has the same opportunity for Stannis. Does he take it? Does he, you know, what does he do? You know, that- right before we went, Right before you hit record, I said, did you have a, an overall theme for this uh, episode? And I just thought of one, which is – it's something Davos says, which he – when uh, Brienne walks up and says that, he says, that was in the past. Mm-hmm. And that is like – that is the thrust of the conversation between Sansa and John. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she says, do you ever wish we'd never left Winterfell that day? Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, we had no idea. We were children. That, that was in the past. Yeah. The, you know, the Red Woman uh, – uh, making the um, ghost placenta that killed Renly, that was in the past. <laughs> like, we're going to see it as this whole episode goes on of like, that's, you know, they, they're really, everyone suffered these horrors. Yeah. And this is about like, what happens next? Yeah. You know? Yeah. True. True. Yeah. That could go both ways too. We're going to see more of that theme. You're so right. We're going to see that theme yeah. play out. I was going to call the, I was going to sort of subtitle this episode, stranger danger, because the episode is <laughs> the episode name itself is like the book of the stranger. And I'm just like, there was a lot of, there was a lot of unfamiliar character pairings that brought new tension. And I'm just like, Ooh, stranger danger. Yeah. Um, but I like yours better. I like the, uh, you know, that was in the past a little bit more. <laughs> well, I love that you say the unexpected character pairings because I think that's sort of what one of the letdowns of last season was that we saw those things, you know, like, and even in season four, I guess, when we saw Littlefinger and 
um, Sansa at the Vale, it was like, oh, we're getting these interesting pairings of people that like, you know, maybe they're going to grow into their power in this way or whatever, you know, Ari and the Hound and whatever. And, um, and then it just didn't really get fulfilled last year. Yeah. Yeah. Cool to see that. I mean, Brian and Pod, of course, that was a, that was a hit. <laughs> But um, yeah, so we're, well, we're going to stay. We're going to keep our conversation at like one one location in yes. this episode. So, uh, so we're going to skip to that part that happens later in the episode, which is they're back at Castle Black. They're all sitting down to dinner. Um, and John receives a letter. Yes, from Ramsey. Yep. Uh, which is not, you know, as far as I know. That's not the pink letter that's in the books. Let's describe um, the pink letter for those who haven't read the books. Uh, I <laughs> I didn't do any homework on this, and I don't remember exactly what it was. But uh, as I recall from years past, when <laughs> I looked into it, there's like a there's a letter that uh, Ramsey sends, and uh, it's believed that he's saying that he's sort of reporting on Winterfell and Stannis's fate and that that war. I think. Um, and Why is so, it called the pink letter? Is it on like Pink Panther stationery, or what's the? Yep, it's on like their you know pink, their pink stationery. So yeah, it's a pink, it's a pink letter. The Bolton, the Bolton family stationery. Yeah, our, our it is. Pink, great, I mean, man, it's made got, with uh, blood or something. Yeah, we've got the uh, pink stationery to make up for it. You know, we like to, we like to sort of you know show that we're 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 feminine too. We 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 believe in the in the women before we rape them and kill them and you know anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is not the pink letter. All that to be said because. Uh, yeah, I had to. I quickly Googled the pink letter to <laughs> make sure I was right. But yeah, that's where he's Ramsey is claiming that Stannis is dead and, and that he uh, destroyed him. But nobody really knows because of the way that those books ended, Stannis is still yeah alive. I see. Well, I mean, all it's going to take is Brienne yeah. to roll and go, nope, I killed him. I'm surprised she didn't just enter the scene just exactly. then being like, oh, I killed him. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, nothing my happens like that. In the my, my she's been deleted. she's like across the sea getting her ass kicked by somebody else in the books. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's just not anywhere near. I'm, I'm just gonna go, Castle Black. I'm just going gonna say. I mean, you can love the books all you want, but I would hate if that was the story situation because she needs to be. Her story is so aggravating in the books. <laughs> oh, I'm, it's it's fit. It's she is exactly where she needs to be in the show. She's with yeah. Sansa. They're at Castle Black. I also, by the way, and I know we'll talk more about the the, the conversation in a second. But I kind of like the fact we're seeing these. Like, I mean, imagine seeing John, Sansa, Brienne, Pod, Tormund, Davos all ride into battle, basically on the same side with whoever else is with you know. Uh, whatever army they've assembled at that point. Like what a stellar lineup, you know, like if we're, <laughs> if we're picking teams that this is like game of Thrones, high school kickball or something like what a cool team they've, they've kind of haphazardly put together. Right. Hopefully it can stay together. That's the question. Will it, or will it? Well, <laughs> well, <clears throat> so back to Ramsey. So the note that he sends in the show, this is one of the parts that I have, like I had a problem with because it just doesn't make any sense to me. Even when we were, you know, talking about Rickon getting taken, mm-hmm. like the episode before he got taken, um, I, I just don't like. I, I get that Rickon's there as leverage yeah. to say, "Bring me back my queen," um, because Ramsay needs uh, Sansa to cement his hold on Winterfell and the North. You know, to be the true warden of the North. But if he, so he's threatening John with, "Bring my queen back to me." Or I'll kill your brother. Yeah. Uh, and then part of his threat is, and if you don't, I'll kill your brother and rape your wife and kill her. And it's like, well, then it's the same outcome. I don't really. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> now, why don't we just hole up here at Castle Black and see what you do? <laughs> it was, you mentioned in the show notes, and I agree, it, it was kind of a a uh, comic book villain yeah. sort of move and yeah. letter you know it was just like like what what was what was the thing he always it kind of felt like a tell like an evil telegram because instead of like you know in a telegram it's like this is the message stop come at once stop it was like instead it was like this is my plan you will or come and see what was it was that the what he had said like every other sentence was come and see or something to that effect <laughs> yeah yeah it's it like was- i'm gonna rape your sister come and see i'm gonna kill your brother come and see like I'm here now. Come and see. It was just. It was so. It was it. It was in character for Ramsey, but it was kind of a little ludicrous. I mean, it, it kind of is. I, it, it felt like one of those moments in the show where the writers are like, "This is what we want to do. Screw you know, screw Grim. We're right. going this way." You know. 
you know, and one of the interesting things that they have not built up in the show, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times, <clears throat> but it's not a big deal. But in the in the books, it is a huge deal that Castle Black, Black is basically a facade mm. because there's a wall on one side yep. to keep out the wildlings and, you know, the White Walkers and stuff. But on the other side, it's undefended. Yeah. Because because the Night's Watch have nothing to fear from the land of men. True, so yeah. They so they don't care about that. It's just basically like a a, a farmhouse. Yeah. Um. So I assume you know. I mean, I just sort of playing that out in my head. Think well, if you know, if the Boltons actually did march all the way up to Castle Black, we would get something of how easy it is to conquer. We did. We did see a little of that with the two wildling forces. One came around the back, yeah, and one came say, over the wall. Yeah, we got a glimpse of that. And granted, yeah. the they, you know, they were almost just barely able to defend it. On right. the uh, on the the Westeros or the the you know yeah the Westeros side or the Seven Kingdoms side, um, yeah. So that's yeah. Um, interesting. I well, part, maybe that's you know if you take that that story thread, it kind of you know if if I were them sitting there, yeah, him to just kill Rickon doesn't make strategic sense. Yeah, but, you know him to come up there and easily take take them out and and have his way. Yeah, that's kind of scary because like well shit, we almost got overwhelmed by just the wildlings. Imagine an organized army. You know, well, this way, who who is used to living and fighting in the north? It's it's one of those things to me, like just you know, playing it out again, like in my head of like you know, if if I were sort of writing that, I'd think, well, this is one of those perfect opportunities of of John to sort of fake them out, yeah, you know, and make it look like some big army is coming down, but uh, which is exactly what Rob did in an earlier battle yeah. was he sent this huge um, like flank of of men to fight the Lannisters, but then he took a little tiny group around back and killed them or something. Yeah. Maybe that's just in the books. Um, uh, or maybe I got that, vi- maybe I got that wrong. I think he sends a small flank out and the Lannisters like pile on like crazy, but the majority of his army is elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so especially where Ramsay has killed Roos and sort of the strategist is gone from house Bolton. Yeah. It's, yeah. this is the, absolutely the right time for John to be a strategist and say, we're outnumbered. They've got a, you know, a stronger castle uh, that they can defend. We don't have a castle we can defend. Here's how we're going to get them. You know, we're well, going to sneak around Moat Kalen or whatever. And that's going to fall. The, that's going to fall to Sansa. I think we got I think right. at this point, <clears throat> and I, what was interesting is that we didn't see an exchange where John's like, yeah, I got killed. Like, I don't think, I don't know if Sansa is aware of that yet. Um, at least I don't remember seeing anything where he's like, yeah, I got stabbed and I got brought back to life. Isn't that weird? How about you? Like, you know, there was never that (laughs) on screen anyway. So Sansa doesn't, may not understand why, I mean, maybe she just thinks John is beaten down from seeing a lot of crap, you know, and John still hasn't told her like, Hey, I, uh, I saw an army of the undead uh, yeah. come back to life and nearly kill us. That was us. kind of some of that information I thought should happen. When they... Yeah, and maybe, and maybe <laughs> as time goes on, maybe it'll just be implied. Like maybe in another scene, she's like, I, you know, I know what you told me, John, like about what's going on. Like, so it just – because do we need to sit through him telling her that again and seeing like the look of horror on her face? No. That can happen off camera. Um, yeah. But we need it alluded to somehow. But I just like the fact that she's stepping in. She's feeling – you know, I think she kind of tossed it to him at first like, hey, what do you think? And he's like, oh, I don't know. She's like, okay, fine. Well, here's what we're going to do. Um, and she even says something to the fact of I'll do it myself if you're not, yeah. if you're not in, into this. Yeah. And I think where this leads to is that – and there's a teaser for next episode that she confronts Baelish. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe this is where Baelish's plan comes into place because he tells – we have that one little scene where he shows up and <laughs> – <laughs> Robin, Robin, Aaron, who's a little bit more grown up now, but just as ridiculous, is uh, <laughs> is is trying his best to be an archer and just failing miserably. And you know, Baelish shows up and basically just little fingers him with his presence. And and you know, I love that too because it was very, very clear. Robin is just a puppet, and I mean, yeah. almost comically so. But what we did find out was Baelish is you know he's like hey your cousin sans is in trouble and maybe we should start to take the men of the eerie and 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 my first question was where the hell were you guys when stannis was trying this like why didn't you join the fight then when it would have been considerably in your favor unless he just didn't want stannis to be part of the picture i would love a scene where baelish is going i'm so glad stannis is gone because i didn't want to have to deal with that just acknowledging that that was a you know an option right but i'm thinking like you know, i'm guessing next week we're gonna see sansa uh, try to out little finger, little finger, you know, and like, <laughs> and, and like, what, what does she tell him? And it almost looks like, you know, when she, at, when she confronts him in that teaser going, did you know about Ramsey? 
And, you know, just Peter kind of going, uh, uh, you know, like, is yeah. she going to manipulate him? Because she knows he killed um, her aunt Liza. Aunt Liza. Yeah, she knows this. She can lord yeah. that over him as much as she wants. And in fact, it was her testimony with the other lords of the Erie that saved his ass. Right. Like, it's yeah. her saying. So she could, man, if she if she keeps this up, she could be really freaking cool um, and use that to her advantage and basically make. Baelish do whatever she wants and, you know, kind of, you know, well, I, I'm just playing this out. Uh, like, as we're saying it, I, I haven't given this much thought, but is she the true lady of the Eerie? Um, I mean, I guess Robin is the, is the rightful heir and uh, the protector of the veil or whatever, you know, why would she be hmm. their cousins? Yeah, but she, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, she's, that out there. she's no more Lord of the Eerie, Lady of the Eerie than, than, um, than, uh, she could marry Robin and they could control, <laughs> uh, Winterfell and the Vale. And maybe that's what Baelish's plan is. Uh, and she's probably just like, yeah, you're not marrying me to anybody anymore. Cause that worked out really well for me last time. Um, maybe that's, maybe that's why it's well, like, hello, Sansa, I would like for you to now marry your cousin. And she's like, did you know what Ramsey was about? <laughs> married me off to him last time. Cause I'm not having any part of this. And guess what? I mean, what? the only, like she needs to push him out the moon door is really the only. <laughs> I love, I, by the way, I love that scene. And I forget, I, I, I apologize. The, uh, the other Lord of the Eerie who, who popped up earlier in that trial, like he was, there was Robin. And I love when Baelish is like, you know, he's he's trying to give Baelish shit. And then Robin just kind of under his breath is like, maybe we should push him out the moon door. And Baelish is like, yeah. yeah. So maybe you're <laughs> And the guy's like, oh, shit. And Baelish is yeah. just kind of like, oh, yeah. You should listen to your Lord Aaron because he's very wise. And he's just like, maybe we should push him out the moon. I mean, he just said it. It was It's weird seeing Robin go from like this, like almost overdramatic kid who still breastfed to like this. He just says kind of cryptic, weird, scary things under his breath and is, is almost a little bit more underplaying it now, which is kind of cool to see. It's, it's like if you gave Danny Torrance from the shining <laughs> yes. <own> yes. kingdom. <laughs> yes. Although uh, that's, I know what happens to Danny Torrance when he grows up. So, you know, when he, when that, <laughs> maybe that's, but as, as he is as a child, yes, I would, I would agree. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, All Robin needs to do is hold his little finger up and be like, I'm not talking to you. Know, like basically talk oh through his God. finger. Yeah. <laughs> Two little finger. There we go. Yeah. This is a real little finger. <sighs> now it all makes sense. But I do wonder what little finger is up to. And that was a problem with last season too, of him, you know, alluding to he's broken this, his uh, pact, the Lannisters and, yeah. he, and he'd obviously made a deal with the Boltons. Um, and he and sort of assured Sansa of, you know, her safety. And he basically just screwed over everybody. And we know that he's a really, you know, he's a long range strategic guy that's doing yeah. it all for the realm and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I, I would like for it to make sense, but my faith that it does is really diminishing. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. He uh, he's really. I mean, I mean, at this point, Sansa is more a more interesting schemer than him. So yeah. you know, we'll see. And, and maybe, maybe like Varys, he just kind of takes a sec. Maybe he just kind of takes a a back seat to other characters moving forward. You know. Well, yeah. And speaking of that, uh, meanwhile in Marine. Uh, <laughs> This was another scene that, um, you know, just kind of sat with me as like a, a comic booky sort of thing that, like, it, it's it just happened too fast. I'll I'll explain. One of my most hated tropes in fiction is uh, the, <laughs> when people don't share their secret plans with the people on their team, mm -hmm. and <laughs> which is funny because in the cast of Kings. Uh, podcast um one of the guys talks about how his most hated trope is when someone withholds vital information and he's talking about jorah having grayscale uh, not, not telling all the people that he's touching and <laughs> lifting up and stuff <laughs> but to me it's i you know Tyrion could have warned like especially when we had a five minute scene of Tyrion sitting with missing day oh Grey my Warren god you're so right episode, yeah and not telling them what he was going to do and there is a little bit like of him talking to them about, you know, you're, yeah, of course, you're a warrior and you, we tried your way and it didn't work. So now we're going to try diplomacy. Yeah. But still, he could have told them, this is what I'm going to do. And we don't necessarily need to see that. Yeah. 
They could have just understood it, but we know they didn't because then when they confront the people of Marine that they knew, the, the, you know, the freed slaves that you know, questioned Grey Worm and Nissenday on like, what's going on here? How dare you treat with uh, the old masters? So uh, that was just uh, – it, not that it was a bad scene. Um, yeah, Tyrion – No, you're right. So, so much more than Daenerys, Tyrion understands um, that awful, awful – choice you know of look we can we can prosecute a war or we can try to end slavery i think Tyrion, but we can't do both right greatest now. weakness that it's it's stunning he hasn't gotten he hasn't gotten over yet is his inability to trust the right people or the inability his because keep in mind other than and i i'm gonna i i feel terrible what the hell is his former bff's name um uh, Braun. Braun. Other than Braun and maybe Pod, he never told anybody about his wildfire plan with the ships. And I understand a little why he didn't want Joffrey to mess it up, but like, you know, that could have he could have easily that could have been stifled easily. Like, there's a lot of things that he did in season two, and it's on like a lot of the reason Tywin was able to kind of shut him up is because a lot nobody really knew who's do you know whose know. plans were in, in in place so you'd think he would have been like okay i'm gonna involve more people i'm gonna like make sure they know i'm i'm in you know i'm the, yeah. the source of credit for all this stuff but then they'll, they'll ha- i'll have buy-in from them so he doesn't get screwed over again and here he is back in marine basically running around doing secret things that are against yeah. honestly a little against his his self-interest because he has no reason he has no reason not to trust Masende and gray worm yeah um you know they haven't given it's not like and, and he knows that they're slaves so you think he would have been like hey I'm, here's what i'm about to do so just, yeah. it could have easily backfired in his face they could have easily burst right. out in that meeting and be like we're not going to be part of this and, and storm out and then he he doesn't have leverage anymore with the the slave master so it was a yeah. weird calculation on his part and you're so right that whole scene where they're like what should we talk about i don't know like we sat there <laughs> for five minutes and they literally said that out loud like they could have been talking about this like hey here's my plan while we're waiting um what do you well, guys think a- it's another of those uh, comic book, like, you know, sort of tropes where the hero goes, follow me. I've got a plan. Yeah. And I'm always like, no, tell me what your plan is, because I, too, am an autonomous human being. <laughs> and I'm not oh, just going to run into your stupid fucking plan if yeah. I don't know what it is. Well, like, or in the case of, like, Davos, it's like you get you give birth to a smoke placenta, and it's just like, oh, God, I don't want any part of this plan at all. Like, it's just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck this plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. I Do you think – I mean, it's weird, give, again, given everything he has learned and everything you – know, what he's done as a character, it's weird he would just trust – the slavers in any way, you know, yeah. and Sandy and, and Grey Worm like spoke to that. They're like, yeah, you can say all the things you want to them. They're going to betray you at every turn. Like, yeah. why would he not know that? Why would Varys not be like, Hey man, you, I, why wasn't Varys in that scene? That was going to be one of my questions. He was in the, he, he, well, maybe cause he, maybe he stayed behind to talk to the, the slaver because they, you know, they left yeah, the, there. yeah, they left the, the, the hookers to come in to, you know, to please them. But then Varys kind of hung back probably is like, Hey, I'll be the, you know, I'll, be your diplomat while he's away or you know some such thing i don't i don't know right it's just weird that Varys was so oddly silent yeah. um i don't think he spoke one word the entire episode no i don't think so um i i got nothing else to add to that scene that's all i yeah, wanted to say we can, we, let's jump to king's landing yeah a lot of cool <laughs> stuff going on here which is the first time i've said that in a while um <laughs> Because honestly, the King's Landing stuff has been really just like I, it's I said been it. so boring yeah. that I was I was also very surprised by a couple of events that happened. But what's going on that's kind of cool now is that it it and we've kind of got glimpses of this before, but it turned it's starting to look like the High Sparrow is the craftiest one of all because it seems oh yeah like definitely everything going on everything that Cersei is planning everything the high you know everything we saw was an indirect result of the high sparrow influencing and meddling. And I think what they're doing what the high council is, you know, tra- you know, Cersei comes in with Jamie and goes, Hey, we need to actually work together here. Um, we're going to bring in the army. And like, do- I-, I think that's exactly what he wants. I, you know, I think the high sparrow is way, I think he dresses in the whole, like, I'm a pauper. I'm a simple man. I'm a, you know, I think he does that to throw people off. You know, I think oh, he, Yeah. And I was going to say when he gives that speech to Marjorie and he tells his whole background, yeah, um, we we just talked about this on our our Batman Superman podcast. It it had like 
to me, it just had echoes of uh, Heath Ledger's Joker, where he would repeatedly tell oh, yeah. different stories about how he got his scars. Oh, my God. I, like, I think the High Septon is full of shit right here. Yeah, yeah. He made up this crazy story. Wouldn't it be amazing if, like, there's a cut scene of him sitting down with Toman going, I never used to, I wasn't always like this, you know. At one point, yeah. I was a farmer. And right. I used to, like, and he gives, like, a different story. Yeah. Well, because he starts telling the story and Marjorie's like, yeah, this is the book of the stranger. I know it. Yeah. And then he's like, well, except I was going to a feast and (laughs) yeah, (laughs) he changes it around a little bit. Is there? Um, So yeah, he's definitely the most manipulative um, and I wouldn't put it past him that he's, I mean, he's, I I think he is, whatever it is, he has been trying to uh, provoke, you know, the Lannisters and the Tyrells. Well, and they, you have to you have to consider the fact that he kind of installed himself pretty damn quick. You know, yeah. it's we, like they just showed up. It's it's like one day the sept was just taken over by these guys. Yeah, and they were incredibly organized. He was able to draft one of the Lannisters into the the uh, whatever the faith militant. Yeah, um, it, it it feels way too too convenient and i just i every time as they were sitting there in the freaking high council talking about when you know when when uh, Ol- uh, olena and um was it pycelle was in there too or whoever uh, no was. just it was just kevin and kevin and, olena yeah and then so seriously and jamie walked in. like that whole scene i'm just like you guys are playing right into his damn hand like we've seen this scene before only in the reverse where the lannisters are the sneaky ones and, every, and this is just like you guys are gonna do this and it's gonna be the high sparrow has some third level chess going on here that you guys are going to fall victim to well that's interesting because they do say something about that like um I, which I, and uh, you know on one end i don't want to be falling for the red herring that the show gave me like i do i do like your idea that you know the high sparrow is has manipulated all this but I, but what jamie says i th- i think rings pretty true when when he said look this is what the high sparrow counted on was the lannister's and the Tyrells, you know, quibbling over stuff and not realizing what he was up to, where all along he's been manipulating Tommen mm-hmm. behind our backs, which I thought was a, a really cool thing. It, it was just, it was weird how it was revealed, you know, but uh, because it wasn't that obvious. Um, mm-hmm. But when Tommen says to Cersei, you know, that, well, the, the High Sparrow told me this, it's like, Oh my God. Like her, her look should have been like, Oh dude, you have been played like all along. No, you know? man, I, I, I don't think that I think he had that conversation with Toman per, specifically to provoke Cersei. He knows he's like, this kid is really important to her. I'm going to talk to him and I'm going to tell him not to say, knowing he's going to tell his mom, right. knowing that that's going to send her into a tizzy and make rash decisions. Which right, is- right. Right. I don't disagree with that. I just think it's like, I wonder why Cersei's face, if she believes what Jamie says later, why her face when Tommen says that wasn't like, Oh yeah. no, you know, like I wonder why they didn't play that bigger, but um, you know, maybe it's just to twist the knife in us when it, when <laughs> the faith militant flood out yeah, and like yeah. destroy the Tyrell army or whatever. Which well, would be crazy, by the way, if we've waited all this time for the Tyrells to do something and they just get wiped out by the, like, the I kind of hope that happens, honestly, because like this whole time, Olena, you know, Olena's I love Diana Rigg. Don't get me wrong. Every time she's I, I would I would sit there and watch two hours of Diana Rigg just monologuing, honestly. But like she's been talking, yeah, there we really haven't seen or heard of the Tyrells being any kind of exceptional military force. You know, she's always kind of talked about, you know, we, we have riches and stuff and we try to solve our problems by you know, debate and talking and scheming and things. And it's like, it would kind of serve them right. If you know they bring their army in and it was just wiped out, um, <laughs> you know, or, or if Cersei and Jamie thing. betray them and in in maybe they're, pl- maybe they're playing some third level chess and they're like, we know we're being manipulated by the high sparrow. So while we're at it, let's get the Tyrells, completely diminished and then we have some like you know big huge move that we're and maybe they have some other secret army they're going to bring in and wipe everybody out you know who knows well i I did i did get some kind of like satisfaction as a viewer of watching the lannisters and the tyrells put that together and team up yeah you know so i do sort of the the part of me that just wants things to resolve in a you know pleasing fashion is like yeah that that's really interesting. I mean, I really did think this whole time <clears throat> that um, that sort of the, between the Faith Militant and the Tyrells, the Lannisters were going to lose power. It's really interesting to think, no, now the Lannisters and Tyrells have to really consolidate in order to wipe out the Faith Militant. So um, 
I, I'm I'm interested in in how that plays out. I do like your your note, um, and I also agree. It is interesting that they were trying to appeal to Ke- I always forget that Kevin, who is now the hand, is uh, Lancel's father. Uh-huh. Um, and I like the the appeal. Like, do you want to get Lancel back? I think it's interesting. They think they can quote unquote get Lancel back. I'm like, he's been pretty yeah, he's pretty mind wise. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's, he's he's level five Scientologist at this point. He ain't coming back. You know, it's like he's he's on the ship with no whatever the. He's been shown the secret papers, you know. He's on his way. <laughs> Whatever, where they tell you where you. <laughs> I need to watch that documentary because I can't remember. I can't remember. What... <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I did another thing I really liked about these these this set of scenes in King's Landing was um, when Marjorie's talking to Loras, uh, she basically invokes the Tyrell words, which are growing strong, which mm-hmm. Olena has mocked like several seasons ago to Sansa. Like, these are the most, you know, ridiculous house <laughs> words ever. But she basically says that to Loras, like, no, we have to stay strong for, you know, you are the future of our house and you must grow strong. And I, I thought that was very cool. Which is interesting because clearly he's gay. And it's like, I don't, you know, <laughs> is there, there going to be a future? There? I mean, does, doesn't he, you think he knows, like, yeah, she's saying that, but there's not going to be an heir at this point from me. So it's like, who, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, my question is this: Do they flip Loras? Do they flip him to be a faith militant, or does he just, you know, commit some kind of catastrophic suicide that pushes Marjorie over the edge? Or something? like, what's what is his outcome as a character? I don't know. There's just there's been such a cool. Uh, I, I mean, I really in that scene, I felt like, oh man, he's sort of the new Theon. You know, he's really yeah. really had his whole personality changed because. He, he was, you know, such a great knight, like, you know, and that's true. Um, not just like, I mean, he's, he's the knight of the flowers, you know, he uh, gives, doesn't he give Sansa the rose after that? Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. You know, um, after the tourney that Robert has and whatever. And um, he, uh, and he and Marjorie are such a good mirror of Jamie and Cersei, you know, where they're mm-hmm. sort of like mm-hmm. the pretty people that do really well in the tournaments and the, <laughs> the games. But uh, Cersei and Jamie are the ones that are like, no, we're actually fucking and making children together. And <laughs> we also go fight in battles and, <laughs> you know, murder children <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like in the shit. And Loras and, and Marjorie have always been sort of above it, and now they're yeah, the ones in the show. Oh, I never, so. I never thought about that that sort of mirrored um, setup before. Yeah, you're so right. And yeah. it's like it's, it says something too, because Marjorie, you could argue, got a little too big for her britches. Um, yeah. in terms of, like she thought she was, you know, she, she thought she was more skilled as at a, as a schemer or a chess player than she was. And Cersei kind of knocked. The whole reason Marjorie is in in the sept is because of Cersei, and then Cersei just overplayed her hand. Um, in doing that, but right. you know, it's, it was, it was almost because Marjorie thought she was, and I, I don't know. I just feel like I kind of want King's Landing, whatever the story to be to end in just utter chaos, because as we all know, <laughs> it, none of it really matters once the wall comes falling down. Like right. it's not, but it's, it would be great to see, you know, it just, it just turned into this like crazy, you know, like just unholy mess of, of, you have characters, betrayals, and just everything, just to amplify that fact that like none of this really matters. But before it, before the end, it's just going to get worse. Um, Maybe. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, that's when those dragons come over in season fourteen or whatever. When Daenerys yeah. finally gets a boat. Um, so, oh, speaking of Daenerys, let's let's just jump to her. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I we we again as we're covering these in in sort of areas of the realm. Um, I think the Jorah and Dario thing is the first part we see i think we see them before we see uh that all the all the khaleesi's of the doge kaleen but um uh, all the i for the one doge sounds like a great like steppenwolf song or something you know it's like <laughs> all the khaleesi's of the doge kaleen you know it's like one of those like i wouldn't say great steppenwolf song <laughs> all right fine an, un, an unknown sort of <laughs> a deep, deep, deep cut, cut. yeah <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I'm so tired of Jorah Mormont. <laughs> no, I'm with you. Uh, Bora Mormont is what I said. <laughs> Please tell me that's original. Uh, well, I haven't heard it before, but I'm sure someone else has said it. He is the worst. And, um, man, it would have been, it would have been so satisfying if Dario had just like stabbed Jorah also. 
in their, kind of, in their it, whole it looks thing. to the camera like Deadpool breaks the fourth wall, like nods at the audience and smiles and just walks off frame. Like, like oh my god, like <laughs> Dario's now, the shit. I, I did think, um, you know, when the previews and stuff, when we would see uh, Jora and Dario looking over um, Vias Doth Rock and and you know, sort of sneaking around the temple or whatever we saw in the previews, I thought, oh, this is going to be so. So I knew I had I did have faith in that 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 um, uh, Daenerys would rescue herself, but I wondered why they would even be involved. You know, like what are they possibly going to offer to her? And if they do have Jorah and Dario rescue her, it's going to be so lame. I did love that in that big scene, they are sort of like you know born again, like they're the ones watching her and being converted all over again. Like even after she shit. emerges from the fire. Yes, of course. So Which, I didn't way, skip ahead. Yeah. It. Oh yeah, and um, yeah, and they did it in a, a an interesting way where they didn't have to call on the dragons to sort of get her out of of the problem again. I saw so. some I saw some complaints that a lot of people wanted you know dragon or drogon to like land beside her, but I'm like I'm kind of glad that didn't happen. That would have been way too convenient. Um, I like the fact though that her it was actually more dramatic than I thought it would be. I didn't think she was. She basically pulled an Odysseus. So if, if you ever if you're familiar with the story of the Odyssey or the or, or Odysseus, like when he gets back to Ithaca, spoilers at the you know after 20 years he's been away and all these like lords of Ithaca have come to court his wife, and they basically have overstayed their welcome. They've drank his wine, they've you know raped his women and everything. So he shows back up. Athena disguises him as an old man so he can observe because if he just rolled right back in, they would have killed him. So he observes and realizes this is a shitty thing. He tells his wife to invite them all into like a room and whoever can string a, a Odysseus's bow and fire an arrow cleanly through like these ax handles gets to basically be the new king. So they all, yeah, and while they're doing that, they, lo- they, his wife leaves, they lock the doors and then Odysseus reveals himself and just starts killing all the guy, all of those guys. <laughs> and it was very similar in that. Like, they're all like, let us out, let us out. And like, basically he just he wipes and when they're all dead they you know they open it up and then he reveals himself to his wife and it's beautiful story. Man, but like what an re- interesting uh a reference to make there it reminded me so much and i mean if you haven't seen i mean read the book too but if you haven't seen the the hallmark miniseries from like 20 years ago now with armand asante as a i freaking love that miniseries so that's that's my reference point but it was just it was funny to see that that jora and dario were basically like the you know that was their role to play like let's lock the doors you could make a more modern reference of um, in *Inglorious Bastards*, where they lock the Nazis in the theater. While, well, um, yeah. and that that must have been it, right? I mean, there, there must have been some scene we didn't see where Jora and Dario and you know, and that um, other Khaleesi, was like, you know, had a plan. Here's how we're going to do it. You know, you're going to lock the doors, and yeah. Um, but I, I mean, when it, you know, when it, when she initially just kicks over the the brazers, I I was like. What is this temple made of gasoline or Thank something? Thank you. I, I'm like my <laughs> thought was went up they, like, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I you know I thought they had just scrubbed the floor with oil because it was it spread so fast and not realizing that the uh, the the brazier had um, you know had the oil in it. So I, it was I, that was confusing to me at first because it did spread so fast. I was like, what I that? didn't put that together either with the oil. Like, and especially when when you think of all the effects that go into that, you couldn't have shown it like sloshing out or something that you know, would make sense to us. I mean, that, that place just went up. Like <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I need to retract. I mean, yes, the, the Odyssey is a good reference point, but Inglorious Bastards is a better one because when right. she, when that, I mean, uh, what we needed was Sam, uh, Sam Jackson being like, <laughs> being like the oil in a brazier spreads, tw- you know, 10 times faster than regular oil. And, <laughs> and Daenerys had four braziers full, you know, or some such thing. Like he does in Inglorious Bastards where he's talking about the acetate film, you know, the acetate <laughs> film burns 10 times faster. And Shoshana has, over 10 boxes full, you know, like one of those things. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, I mean, I'm so glad a, we got this out of the way by episode four. Thank God, because they could have, again, if this was last season, they would have stretched this to the very end. Yeah. They'd have been like Jesus. And I'm, I'm glad that she, she's like, I've done this before. Um, which by the way, answers that question of, can she only do it once? Clearly she's just immune to fire for, for good. 
um, right as you alluded to before too and i just like that she's well and yeah that's that's sort of the the show conceit is that she is i ra- sure. i mean i'd rather she be right it makes more sense like if like wh- why would it just be a one off unless there you know it just it too convoluted to be like well she can do it this right. once but not any other time and like okay i, I guess um <laughs> But no, I like the fact that they got out of the way, and I like that that she was smart enough to go. And you know, like I always wondered the whole time, I was wondering why she was so cocky with these calls, right? You know, it's like yeah. she's being a little too like they could grab her at any point and just rape the living daylights out of her, you know, or yeah. some or something like that. And she's just like she's just you know talking them, you know, beating them down, you know, berating them and stuff. Like you stupid frat boys, like you have no idea what what's about to happen here. So it was really cool to see you know, an appropriate response to all their, you know, demeaning of her and just, you know, her taking back the, 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 I mean, before when she did it, she had like what, 10, 12 people. Yeah. In her, was, and now she's got the whole Dothraki Kalasar, all of them, you know, essentially yeah. on her side. Yeah. But you know, in the bigger picture, are we right back where we started? Yeah. Just bigger. I, I mean, I get that it's more. Yeah. And, um, and I do you know, I do get there's a, um, and even though I, I cite um, <laughs> the Storm of Spoilers and Cast of Kings, I really uh, I haven't listened to it since the beginning of the uh, season. Not that you shouldn't, because they're great. And if you want to listen to a bunch of stuff, do. But just because we're, um, I don't want to sort of put their thoughts in my head too much. So most, you know, when I cite them, it's from things I remember from three, four weeks ago. But I do know that they have been, uh, pushing this idea that, you know, given George Martin's original book notes and stuff, the idea was sort of every book would be five years later. Mm. And wow. so this whole thing got stretched out because instead of aging people by <laughs> half a decade, he decided to age them by like, you know, six weeks or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So Daenerys, you know, basically Daenerys should have gotten there a lot sooner to Westeros. Yeah. But he sort of had to extend her whole story. And so I think that's one of those, you know, when we, it's sort of a reverse butterfly effect. Now the show has to, had to kind of play by his rules for a while. Yeah. And so I think this season we're, we're finally getting the, the show to go, no, we're going to play by our rules and the rules of, you know, more quickly paced narrative. Well, let's so. go back. I want to tie this together to the theme. So if the theme is forget the past or that was in the past, yeah. I'm going to tie that and see, let's look at, the song of ice and fire. If you look at the first half of the show is very much the ice half. And the second half is very much <laughs> the fire half in terms of the, the big moments. Um, there you go. Oh, it's an alarm. Uh, you know, I I'm looking at characters like, uh, like even little finger, but like, you know, obviously John Sansa, Davos, Melisandre, like, you know, that was in the past. It's kind of their opening. And it seems like, seems like, um, Daenerys, Jora, like those guys are just interested in repeating the past in greater glory. Like let's <laughs> recycle the past. And I, and I, I don't know if that's intentional, but it's kind of an interesting contrast. If we're going to contrast ice and fire and contrast this philosophy with, you know, what Daenerys is doing, basically re- rehashing the yeah. past tenfold, you know, and is that, if, if that's meaningful or intentional, how does that, how does that work or not work once she tries to come across the ocean? You know, cause like, I know she is, you know, it's, it's the whole problem of Daenerys. Like she just, she needed to learn to be a leader. Yeah. And I just don't think she did. You know I mean? When those, like they pointed it out in this episode, even the wise masters or old masters or whatever they're called offered her 10,000 ships, like to just get lost, get out of Slaver's Bay, like take your whole army to Westeros where you belong. And she was like, no, I will be a queen. I will rule. And then she didn't. She just hopped on a dragon when stuff got hairy and flew away. <laughs> She's got and Targaryen. It's like, oh my god! She's like got Targaryen know. delusions of grandeur. You know, she is her. She is Definitely. the Mad King's daughter, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She because she was it was her uh, granddaughter. No, because it was Aegon. Aegon's not her dad. I thought it was Aegon's her older brother. Viserys is her middle brother, and then she's the youngest. Am I miss? Am I missing this completely? Hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I'm. I'll look it up. Because I Let's thought Eric, cause Eris was the Mad King, <laughs> and because that way, if if Tyrion should happen to be, God forbid, Tyrion should happen to be Eris bastard son, that would make he and Daenerys sister, brother and sister, wouldn't it? Unless, am I completely missing this? Yeah, you're right. No, she is the daughter of the Mad King. That's right. okay. Yeah, so I kind of <laughs> like that. There's a little of that. I mean, she, yeah, she's got pure motives and everything, but I like that. There's a little bit of this, like you know. 
power lust and just kind of a not not an unhinged quality, but just sort of a you know she's not. I look at her and I look at Sansa, and I feel like Sansa, as a, as a character evolution, is way more put together. Yeah. Um, and Daenerys just kind of you know she has a lot of kick ass moments, but I think she gets so caught up in those that she doesn't know how to put two and two together, you know? See, and, and the way I just keep reading it is that that's part of that is just the show's fault that they keep showing her in this way. Like we're supposed to be on her side. And I've just felt like from the beginning, like, but she sucks. Mm-hmm. I'm not on her side. She's not growing or changing or learning anything. I mean, you know, that's, that's just been my frustration all along is, is more of the way it's presented to us. Like, I mean, even in the scene where she lecture these calls on what a great, queen she will be and you know she's the one that deserves to lead all these people really why because you're you're unburnable i mean every time you lead people you ruin cities and fuck things up you know that's a great that's a great point the calls are actually successful (laughs) they've built a city (laughs) you know they go conquer lands and stuff like that uh, I and, love the fact that one of them, by the way, like io9 was referring to the lead call because I don't think he was given a name other than uh, they just keep referring to him as call Brogo. So it's just like <laughs> <laughs> they just like call Brogo and his bro and his bro, uh, yeah. his bro harem are. Uh, I did are see them referred to as the Broth Rocky. <laughs> Broth Rocky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I don't know. I just and, and I did kind of like that they they referred and I need to go back to season one to see if this is true. But apparently I didn't realize her wedding to Khal Drogo was in that same temple. She's like, and this was the spot where he right. said, and, and, but you're right. Like she was like going on. She's like, yeah, Khal Drogo said that my stallion was going to mount the world. And they're like, yeah, so what? Like what happened to him? And what happened yeah, to I you? Mean, and it's like, those Rocky are seriously practical people. Yeah. You know? They don't, they, uh, they, they just want, you know, grass for their horses and, and to ride around killing people. And, you know, having sex with <laughs> the others. And that's sort of like, they're pretty simple about it. You know, she yeah. has, she's the one with the ridiculous ideas. Yeah. I'm going to return to this land that I never grew up in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and be the queen of it. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, just, what? you're so right. Like there is like, I, I was on team Daenerys and I still sort of am, but the more, <laughs> the more you chip away at her mystique, the more, yeah, you know what? <laughs> it is kind of bullshit. Like she doesn't, it's cool that she's got and i guess i think i am i'm captivated and taken by all her kick-ass moments it makes me go yeah more of this but then when you actually actually think and going even going even back to yeah. um who was the uh the king's guard who defected and went over to be her um her uh Barristan, Barristan, right? Selmy. yeah so even him when he's like you know, because he's kind of other than Jora, he's the first person to really sign up for the cause and be like, oh, I'm going to protect yeah. you. And you even think back then and go, well, why? Like, yeah, she's the rightful heiress. But other than that, like, is there really any reason to to want that to happen? You know, it's <laughs> like maybe he was just thinking maybe he was like thinking, oh, yeah, in two months, she'll ride her dragon back over. It'll eat Joffrey and I'll be back back in you know King's Landing and all this will be over. But, yeah, maybe just her her hanging out in Marine just got too uh, too long winded. Well, I, I, yeah, it's it's funny because just talking about it makes me like the other people a little bit better because I do see <laughs> – I do see like – you know, I never thought I'd be a fan of the Dothraki, but I'm definitely making the case for the people that just get shit done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, the calls did. You didn't like what they were doing, but they got it done. And, you know, same with like Jamie, who's a King's Guard, who's broken his oath and, you know, is back in King's Landing like with another – king who's you know now his son slash nephew and uh you know it's uh, those those people that in this world that just go g- get shit done yeah. are are definitely preferable to the ones that you know um I, have magic powers i guess so it, yeah. that's you know this will be interesting <laughs> here here um, uh anyway so uh real quick i had i thought that um thinking of like that that theme of you know the past is in the past yeah that short scene we got with theon and yara i thought was yeah. just they didn't even have to say much of anything yep. to make it known that that's exactly what theon was saying was like yep. Yep. whatever you thought of me is in the past you should rule and let me help you well i didn't realize i don't he, know how he's gonna help her well, <laughs> but i think he can help her because technically he is as a as a male heir he is an ahead of her to be to be king so if he even though he doesn't have a penis anymore and can't make kids, um, you know, I think him him basically vouching for her is a huge sort of 
and I don't know how a King's moot goes. We'll find out, but maybe that's a huge sort of mark, you know, that huge, like, you know, a, a, a reference on a resume, if you will, for Yara. Yeah. Um, I think it's just like a big tug of war and he's saying, I'll be your anchor. <laughs> I'm going to grab that knotted rope. <laughs> rope. Is it literally a tug of war? Where no. <laughs> it'd be awesome. <laughs> like, like there, and you know, on a little tiny island, and the loser goes into the sea. <laughs> That'd be so great. <laughs> They're like, "All right, everybody, let's get the rope out." And they're like, "Wait, really?" And like, "No, yeah, this is how it goes." There um, honestly I, is some goofy shit uh, like that where they're on an island or on a, uh, a plank or a platform or something like that. But <laughs> I love Yara so much, and again, the the more I love her, the more I'm like, she's probably going to die damn it but she uh she's so damn cool she's like going back to your whole i want people who get things done she's probably the queen of get things done in the show like you know she's uh and the fact that she she's now in a position to be a queen quote unquote is really cool i was a little concerned i well not concerned i was a little confused why she thought theon was you know wanting to be maybe it was just pure coincidence i mean for us it was pure coincidence as viewers like he just shows up he doesn't know there's a king's boot right, right. i think he shows up on the dock so like yeah your sister is going to be in the king's boot he's like oh okay yeah um so i you know for us but I, it was just weird for her to go to to insist that he's back for that purpose like well i kind of got it because her her father especially in that last scene that we saw with him was just such a dick to her yeah you know and um and so she's definitely suspicious you know she's the one that's that's uh, pro- proven herself, um, you know, with the commanding ships and armies and and leading men and stuff like that, and and she's just never gotten any credit for it. So that's true, yeah. And and to be fair, like she went to go rescue him, and he didn't want to be rescued, so it's a little weird that he just shows up automatically. Um, I wonder what he's going to do to prove his trust, prove you know, prove her trust in him. Like, there's got to be something. He can't just say that. Like, there's got to be right. something he does where she's like, "You are my brother again." You know, like something where it really resonates. He's got to deliver something. Yeah. Uh, one more sort of real quick, uh, real quick scene was back at Winterfell. We had yeah. uh, you know, Doctor Evil himself sitting there skinning an apple because apparently you know they're gonna, they're gonna drive home the fact that we're the flayed men sigil like that's what we we, we flay our fruit even look at this get and it then, and then yeah get it i'm surprised i'm surprised he didn't look at the camera deadpool just just wink. Like, wink. yeah 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 <laughs> it's a little heavy-handed um and then osha rolls in and i kind of knew as soon as she rolls in i'm like this ain't this is not gonna go well for you osha there's no way and i'm like when they had her you know they 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 motioned off camera like she's gonna go for the knife i'm like there's no way she's gonna be the one that kills ramsay no effing way so it's like well how is how is she gonna meet her grizzly end um and i thought it was (laughs) i thought it was all appropriate you know him kind of stringing her along just for the hell of it just for the sport of it you know i i got it but i you know and i you uh, you saw my note which i made which was uh i just if she had been able to just stab him, I would have thought, well, that was just too easy. <laughs> but yeah. then when he was able to stab her, I was like, well, that was just too easy. <laughs> it, but was I mean, it though? I mean, we, I mean, good Lord, he stabbed his father that easily. It's, it's, there's a precedent for it. You know, maybe he had a secret. This, I mean, that was his father's knife was on his person. You know, you saw it even. I didn't, I didn't notice it, but you saw the knife. So this yeah. was like almost like a little secret thing he had hidden somewhere, but it was. Yeah, that dude works with ruthless efficiency. There's not a, you know, it doesn't surprise me that he just would have offed Osha. And well, honestly, where else could she go as a character? So it was kind of like, well, all right. <laughs> there was a great conspiracy that, as far as I know, only sort of existed uh, after the last episode where the Umber showed up with Rickon and Osha, which was that um, the, the conspiracy theory was that the Umbers aren't really helping out the boltons mm. and that they had sort of planted you know they were giving them a little bit mm-hmm. but um this uh redditor or whoever um first noticed it may, had some great like you know breakdown of all the all the things that that show that the umbers are really playing ramsey and you know like from the that wasn't a real wolf's head um it was too small or something like that compared to another dire wolf's head or whatever um I thought it was this great idea of like, yeah, this other house, you know, they got to be tough and pretend to befriend him and give him a little, but really they've just planted two spies in his house, whatever. And then, so when she died, I was like, well, so much for that conspiracy theory. Yeah, but maybe that could still hold. And, you know, she was just, was a shit spy, you know, or a shit assassin, or maybe she just, she went off, off the reservation and tried to kill him when that was not part of the plan. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, it's so hard in this show with so many people where you with so many characters where you see that potential of what they were or we kind of imagine their potential or something yeah. 
it was just weird that we hadn't we haven't seen her in all the time that we haven't seen Rick on. Yeah. And she's dead. Like with I mean, she had like three lines or something. Yeah, but it says a lot about how she didn't evolve. And you know, she tried that same yeah. trick on Theon and got away with it. And she tries it with yeah. Ramsey and Ramsey's like, I'm not Theon. And she sure. and, you know, he, he almost drives that point home by saying, Yeah, guess what? The- I made Theon tell me that you tried yeah. this on him and uh ha 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 and stabbed, you know, right right. But I'm kind of obsessed with this idea that the umbers are a sleeper cell. <laughs> That's, because, that's the phrase I was looking for. Think about it though, because like if 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 Sansa's plan rings true, and you know they're the ones that basically, yeah, you know, the Umbers are in Winterfell, and they just start you know killing Karstarks everywhere and open up the gates for for Sansa's crew to roll in. Like that would be so cool, you know. That's again, it's 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 in that round. There are so many cool things I want this show to do, but I'm glad they don't because. It's that it's it's holding back that makes it so compelling. It's that sort of wish fulfillment, but in very tiny amounts, right? So, yeah, I want to see that happen, but if they don't, you know, they've been doing a great job this season of giving us just what we need when we need it. So, oh, yeah. yeah Wrap it up. Where do you think? Uh, where do you think it's heading next episode? What do you think? Uh, where do you think we're off to? Well, it's funny because I've watched the the coming soon, and and none of it sticks. You know, so I wonder if we're going to get another episode like last week which is that sort of like we're going to get you know several exposition scenes because <clears throat> there's a scene of Jockin handing poison to Arya which is funny because I think you even brought up like it's there's this real disconnected scene of her mixing the yeah. poisons in the in the last episode um which they've never explained but I, I believe is like a big ass long thing in the books of you know how she's learned that skill along with everything else so um you know, there's there's some training. I like the uh, little finger um, scene. I'll be curious to see what happens there. There was a scene of the king's moot. Um, mm-hmm. Was there anything else that you picked up on that? Oh yeah, a uh, Bran seeing. Oh White. yeah, and I, you know, we've seen that little clip a couple times in trailers, and I can't yeah. wait. To, my suspicion has been that the White King note can see him warging into wherever when they are. Green seeing, yeah. Or, that- but here's here's another twist: is that a scene from the future? Is that something where Bran is seeing like, you know, his family turn into White Walkers and like he's like, oh God. Ooh. And then the White King is like, haha, and you know, sees him and snaps well, him out of it. That's one of those things where, you know, I said in, in one of our last episodes of I I I I sort of think they need to tell us the rules of what his green sight is doing or whatever yeah. he's doing or his heart yeah. treeing. And they haven't yet, but I'm pretty sure in the books that time just doesn't matter when they're in yeah. the tree. Yeah, and so they can see in the future, in the past, in the present, and there's and it's sort of all mixed up, you know. So <clears throat> I don't. So that's a really interesting thought. Of well, here's let me take it another way too. I didn't think of his family, but I did think is Bran seeing the destruction that's about to go south of the wall, and then that's the thing that's gonna, you know, b- b- like inspire him to. Or uh, or is he seeing things in the present? The White King sees him and then goes, "Oh, I know where you are," and. Basically, oh. that they it starts to head towards the tree, and then they get the get the hell out of there because the and then basically leave Max von Sydow to his fate in the tree. Apparently, um, I wonder yeah. if that's not the case. Like if they if they've been looking for the tree for a while, or if that just if if sort of him warging in that way, and does he do it outside of the uh, Three Eyed Ravens' control? Like does he do it and basically expose right. the cover? You know, is that. And that teaches him to basically, you know, he basically feels terrible because he's betrayed. You know, that's why Max von Sato is like, be careful with this shit. Don't do it. Exactly. Here. And then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, you can be seen by other magical things. You know, they can find you. So I don't know. Right. It'll be cool to see. I, I Again, I am. I, am I like that. Thought. I, think you're, I think you're dead right about that. I think that's um, that's going to be the part where we see Bran breaking the rules that have not really clearly been expressed again. Yeah. <laughs> Someone knows some information that they're not telling Bran. <laughs> like yeah. these are the rules of your secret powers. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's such a good thought that that's where it happens. I do think, um, I, I, I do think we're going to get two big battles this season um, or at least a fight. And then a battle one will be the Tyrells and the faith militant. And then the other will be what people have been calling the Battle of the Bastards, where John, John's army fights Ramsay's army. Yeah. So I would be, pretty, I'd be pretty satisfied. I think if we get both of those things, I'm not gonna. Know. I'm not. I I don't think the Terrell thing is gonna be much of a battle. I think it's gonna be okay. more like a, 
you know, they bring them all in and then just the faith militant slaughters them all or, or the faith militant. <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, think about this. What if, the, what if this whole time, because we haven't seen a lot of what the High Sparrow has been doing to the populace of King's Landing. Has he been preaching to them? Have they been, right. how, how many people have they converted in King's Landing that when, when the uh, Tyrells roll in, it's not just the faith militant, but it's normal people. Um stabbing and killing and all of a sudden it's like clear that king's landing is very clearly the high sparrows domain now like you know what and at that point again what does that serve like well then somebody just has to take him out like what is what where does that head i i don't know again all of this i'm kind of hoping for pure chaos because if there's if there's one decisive winner then you're like where do they go from here and it's like if it all goes to the wall i i don't see anybody in king's landing even the even the martells um having any any influence or any any purpose at the wall other than to just you know be cannon fodder well um, we've definitely i they've definitely exhausted our patience for the lannisters at king's landing yeah i mean nobody cares about that you know like in the story sense there's the interesting stuff is no longer in king's landing so Montoman is such a weak pancake that it's just like what what is he gonna he's not gonna do anything he's clearly he's gonna die the witch told Cersei so so it's like that's, yeah you know I you know and it's something I brought up uh, in maybe a couple different episodes I really I'm just so interested in how the different religions operate in the world and so yeah. it would be really interesting to see the faith militant do something decisive that establishes them literally as a violent religious power. Yeah, where you have sort of Bran and the Three-Eyed Raven as the, you know, benign, seeing, uh, all-seeing, you know, omniscient uh, religious power, and Melisandre as sort of the dark, mystical religious power. Like that's yeah. those are all interesting. And oh, in the previews, we also meet the n- next Red Woman who visits Varys mm. and Tyrion. So that's right. Yeah, um, I don't know much about her. I just know that that's who that that actress is. So. Interesting. Well, that yeah. being said, uh, you can find us online at toddandtaylor.com and wherever fine podcasts are downloaded or sold or how, I mean, this is free. So yeah. wherever you want to find us, we're, we're there. Where, they, where can they find you? I am on Twitter at hey Todd A. Where and I am on Twitter at at, at taylortrask.com. Uh, no, not dot .com. Jesus. <laughs> just Taylor Trask. It's just, just at Taylor Trask. Trask. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. brain fart but yeah this cool been- and we, we so we did we'll, i'll put a quick plug in there so this is our podcast called wednesday in westeros uh we do this it comes out every wednesday we review game of thrones but we do have another season of our our normal podcast the todd and taylor show going on right now um we just put up the first episode from that where we talk about batman v superman dawn of justice yeah i thought it was a pretty good conversation yeah i'm looking forward to talking about civil war uh and some other things with you on that podcast so Absolutely. um Awesome. Yeah, check us out all of those places. iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud. Get to it. <laughs>